on board is tonight. Search concludes. Five passengers aboard the missing submarine Titan confirmed dead after debris was located near the Titanic following an extensive search. Turbocharged ties. President Biden emphasized common ground with Indian Prime Minister and announced joint initiatives. Spirit strikes. Spirit air system workers leave production at a standstill following a failed labor deal. Milena Magic. The Royal Ascot's Ladies' Day brings in makers of masterpieces from across the globe to flaunt their flair. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Sanuvi Mudanayaka. Good evening and you are watching World News this Friday night. The Titanic submersible that gripped the world's headlines met its end in what the U.S. Coast Guard calls a catastrophic implosion that killed all five passengers abroad. But the search that led to this discovery and the race against time to find the passengers alive became a five-day multinational rescue operation that captured global attention. At the moment, all trips to the site will be stopped until the course of the Ocean Gate expedition submersible failure is determined. The massive international search for five people aboard a missing submersible in the North Atlantic came to a grim end on Thursday after an unmanned deep-sea robot discovered debris confirmed to be from the lost vessel near the century-old wreck of the Titanic. Here's U.S. Coast Guard Rear Admiral John Mauger. On behalf of the United States Coast Guard and the entire Unified Command, I offer my deepest condolences to the families. An ROV, or remote operated vehicle, from the vessel Horizon Arctic discovered the tail cone of the Titan submersible approximately 1,600 feet from the bow of the Titanic on the seafloor. The ROV subsequently found additional debris. In consultation with experts from within the Unified Command, the debris is consistent with the catastrophic loss of the pressure chamber. Those who perished include British billionaire and explorer Hamish Harding, Pakistani-born business magnate Shahzada Dawood, and his 19-year-old son Suleiman, French oceanographer Paul-Henri Narjolet, and Stockton Rush, the American founder and chief executive of Ocean Gate Expeditions, the company behind the sub. This was a uh, incredibly uh, complex uh, case, uh, and we're still working to develop the details uh, for the timeline involved uh, with uh, this casualty. The Titan had set off Sunday with 96 hours worth of oxygen, according to Ocean Gate, in what was expected to be a two-hour dive to the Titanic. But upon its descent, the sub lost contact with its support ship. Rescue teams from several countries had spent days searching thousands of square miles of open seas with planes and ships for any sign of the 22-foot vessel. Hopes had been lifted when Canadian search planes using sonar buoys recorded undersea noises they described as banging sounds. But Mogger dismissed the idea that the noises came from the Titan. There doesn't appear to be any uh, connection between uh, the noises and uh, uh, the location uh, on the seafloor. Again, uh, this uh, was a, a catastrophic uh, implosion of the vessel, which would have generated uh, a significant broadband sound uh, down there that uh, the sonar buoys would have picked up. Chris Brown, a friend of victim Hamish Harding, said he bowed out of the adventure due to safety concerns. Parts of the submarine that I'd seen in the testing in the Bahamas just seemed a bit shoddy. They're using industrial piping for ballast. Um, they, they're using an Xbox controller for, for the steering. They flatly refuse to get any form of certification. Questions about the Titan's safety were raised in 2018 during a symposium of submersible industry experts and in a lawsuit filed by OceanGate's former head of marine operations, which was settled later that year. OceanGate Expedition said in a statement, our hearts are with these five souls and every member of their families during this tragic time. 
U.S. President Joe Biden and Narendra Modi hailed a new era in their country's relationship after the White House rolled out the red carpet for the Indian Prime Minister, tooting deals on defense and commerce aimed at countering China's global influence. I've long believed that the relationship between the United States and India is one of the, will be one of the defining relationships of the 21st century. U.S. President Joe Biden on Thursday rolled out the White House red carpet for Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi in a colorful opening ceremony with some 7,000 well-wishers in attendance. After a meeting in the Oval Office, both leaders touted deals on defense and commerce aimed at countering China's global influence. Our discussions today and the important decisions we have taken have added a new chapter to our comprehensive and a global strategic partnership. Biden administration officials said sweeping agreements were made on semiconductors, critical minerals, technology, space, and defense cooperation. India, out of. But Modi's visit was not without controversy. A small group of demonstrators were seen protesting near the White House over alleged discrimination against minorities, including Muslims, under Modi's government. Thursday's joint press conference marked the first time Modi has taken questions in such a format in his nine-year tenure. When asked about steps he would take to improve the rights of Muslims and other minorities, Modi said the benefits of the Indian government's policies are accessible to everyone. There's absolutely no space for discrimination. And when you talk of democracy, if there are no human values and there is no humanity, there are no human rights, then it's not a democracy. Following the news conference, Modi delivered a speech to Congress and drew a crowd of onlookers who chanted his name during applause lines. The only two Muslim women members of Congress, Representatives Ilhan Omar and Rashida Tlaib, along with Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, separately said they would boycott Modi's address to Congress citing the allegations of abuse of minorities, especially Muslims. Not just India-USA relationships, but Washington-Beijing relations appear to be rocky, yet again after U.S. President Joe Biden called Chinese President Xi Jinping a dictator. Biden played it down, saying the comment has not undermined the two countries' relations. U.S. President Joe Biden on Thursday downplayed the impact of his recent comments comparing Chinese President Xi Jinping to a dictator. He said at a news conference that calling Xi a dictator did not undermine Washington's relationship with Beijing. I expect to be meeting with President Xi sometime in the future, in the near term, and uh, I don't think it's had any real consequence. He also suggested that he would not tone down his rhetoric on China in the future. Biden's comments on Thursday followed Chinese ambassador to the U.S. Xie Fang warned of consequences if Washington isn't to take any immediate and earnest actions. Earlier in the day, Fang made strong protests to senior White House and State Department officials. The Chinese embassy called Biden's earlier comments a smear, which seriously contradicts basic facts and undermines mutual trust. Speaking at a campaign fundraiser in California on Tuesday, Biden equated Xi to a dictator and claimed that Xi was embarrassed when the Chinese balloon was blown off course without his knowledge. It prompted a fierce backlash from Beijing. They're an open political provocation. China is strongly dissatisfied with and firmly opposed to this. Biden's dictator remark also came only days after U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken made his visit to China, where he said the two countries had made progress towards getting their relations back on track. However, now given the Chinese embassy is describing the nature and impact of Biden's comment as very negative, this could add more tension to Washington-Beijing relations and could undermine the progress made during Blinken's trip. Former Brazilian President Jair Bolsonaro's trial on charges of abuse of political power and misuse of public media began in the country's highest electoral court in Brasilia.
The charges stem from a meeting Bolsonaro held with foreign diplomats in July 2022, in which he is accused of spreading false information about Brazil's electoral system and bringing its credibility into question, a strategy the former president used in his re-election campaign. The far-right Bolsonaro has said the charges are not justified and trivialized the proceedings, describing them as a storm in a glass of water. According to a report put forth by Judge Gonzalez, the former president allegedly said the 2022 elections might be compromised due to fraud in his meeting with the ambassadors. If proven guilty, Bolsonaro could find himself unavailable to run for public office until 2030. That may not be the end of his troubles, though, as he also faces multiple criminal investigations that could put him behind bars. French President Emmanuel Macron told global leaders that no country should have to choose between tackling poverty and dealing with climate change at a summit tasked with reimagining the world's financial system helping debt burden countries to deal with climate change, as well as fixing the global financial system to bring more balance between Western countries and those from the global South. These are just some of the aims of the summit which began in Paris on Thursday. Dozens of world leaders are attending the two-day event, many from developing countries hoping to see change in action. French President Emmanuel Macron used his opening comments to send a message. He called on more financial help from the private sector. No country should ever have to choose between reducing poverty and protecting the planet. I think we can be honest. There is a lot of liquidity in this world. There's a lot of money. I don't think we'll manage to change the system completely, even though I know that some people aspire to do so. But we can make it work a lot better if this money and this liquidity are at the service of the planet. The summit is co-hosted by Barbados's first ever female Prime Minister, Mia Motley. Vulnerable nations like hers want more money because they did little to cause climate change, but face its worst effects. She has been a strong advocate for reimagining the role of the World Bank and IMF in an era of climate crisis. And that transformation is required because while the world knew since the 1890s that we were facing the warming of the climate, we chose not to heed the advice of scientists. Observers are looking for tangible progress, including keeping promises already made, such as a 2009 pledge to deliver $100 billion a year in climate finance, to developing nations by 2020, which still hasn't been fulfilled. The summit will be a platform for ideas before major economic and climate meetings later this year, such as the G20 in India in September and COP28 in Dubai in November. We'll be back with more world news after this short commercial break. Welcome back. Economists have warned that Britain was now on course for recession, predicting that the bigger-than-expected rise by the bank would hit the economy like a giant wave. It comes as the Bank of England has raised interest rates to a 5%, defying hopes for a lesser increase in a further blow to homeowners struggling with catapulting mortgages. The Bank of England surprised markets on Thursday with a bigger-than-expected interest rate hike. It raised its benchmark by half a percentage point to 5%. That was double the increase that traders had generally expected. Governor Andrew Bailey said this week's inflation numbers left him no choice. We think inflation is going to come down markedly this year, but there are signs of it being more persistent. And I thought it was right that we took this action and this decisive action today. The move came a day after fresh data showed inflation refusing to come down. It stuck at 8.7% in May, when a decline had been expected. That leaves the UK with the fastest price rises of any major economy. Soaring food prices were one big factor. Now the jump in rates will mean fresh pain for mortgage holders. But Bailey said not acting would be even worse. Well, I understand you know, the difficulty and the, you know, the pain it causes for, for many people. and I do understand that. What I would say, though, is that if we don't get inflation back down to target, then it goes on for much longer and the pain goes on for longer. Ministers have so far rebuffed calls to help mortgage payers. But the mix of stubborn inflation and rising rates spells political peril for the government of Prime Minister Rishi Sunak. 
and worse could yet be to come, with rates now forecast to hit 6% before the end of the year. Boeing suppliers freight aero systems halted work at a Wichita, Kansas plant after workers voted against a new labor deal and for a strike. Spirit makes well charges for Boeing 737 MAX and pylons for Airbus A220s at the plant. Shares of aerospace giants Boeing and Airbus dropped on Thursday after workers and a major supplier to the plane makers announced they are going on strike. Spirit Aerosystems said it will suspend factory production on Thursday at its plant in Wichita, Kansas, where unionized employees are expected to hit the picket line Saturday after rejecting a four-year contract. Spirit makes the entire fuselage of Boeing's best-selling 737 MAX narrow-body jet, as well as sections of most of its other aircraft. The company also makes parts for the Airbus A220. Nearly 90% of its workers are employed at the Wichita factory. A prolonged work stoppage at Spirit eventually could force plane makers to slow or stop jetliner assembly at a time when both Airbus and Boeing are ramping up production. Last month, Boeing CEO Dave Calhoun said it would be difficult to make contingency plans for a strike at Spirit. The two sides reached a tentative contract agreement last week, but workers voted to reject the deal and strike. Shares of Spirit Aerosystems fell 11 percent in morning trading. A key bridge connecting Russia and ex Crimea with the Ukrainian mainland was reportedly damaged by Ukrainian missiles. The so-called Gate of Crimea, known to Russians by a different spelling as the Konga Bridge, is one of a handful of links between Crimea, which Moscow annexed from Ukraine in 2014, and mainland Ukraine. Russian-appointed officials claim that Ukrainian missiles struck one of the few bridges linking Crimea with Ukraine's mainland on Thursday cutting off one of the main supply routes for Russian occupation forces in southern Ukraine. The Konha Bridge connects the Russian-held area of Kherson with the Crimean Peninsula, which was annexed by Russia in 2014. However, Ukraine did not claim responsibility for the bridge attack. Russian-appointed governor Vladimir Saldo released a video of him inspecting the site. In it, he appeared to allege the attack was ordered by the UK. This is another meaningless act perpetrated by the Kiev regime on orders from London. It solves nothing as far as the special military operation is concerned. It is absolutely bezluzdo. That means stupid in Ukrainian. A bus station manager told the attack disrupted transportation, with several bus routes cancelled or severely delayed. Alternative routes require hours-long detours over roads in poor condition. Russian state-owned media cited investigators saying four missiles were fired by Ukrainian forces at the bridge. And Russia's news agency quoted transport officials installed by Moscow saying repairs could take weeks. On Wednesday, a Ukrainian brigade released footage of what it claimed to be its soldiers storming enemy positions during fighting near Bakhmut. That's along the southern front, where Kiev claimed Thursday it has recaptured eight villages in the last two weeks, and where it is in the early stages of its most ambitious counteroffensive of the 16-month-old war. Russia says it has fended off the Ukrainian counterattack and inflicted heavy casualties, which Ukraine denies. In his nightly address, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky also accused Russia, without evidence, of preparing to carry out what it called a terrorist attack at a nuclear plant in southeastern Ukraine that would release radiation from the plant. Kremlin denied it, calling the allegation, quote, an other lie. Welcome back. For more news, let's take you on the world journey. The temperature in Beijing reached 41 degrees Celsius and shattered the record for the hottest day in June as heat waves that had seared northern China a week earlier returned to the Chinese capital. The previous June high was logged in June 1961 when the mercury hit 40.6 Celsius. A new law under consideration in the Netherlands would outlaw processing and advertising all pets with attributes proved to cause medical issues such as overly short snouts, which animal rights activists say are cruel. A fire extinguisher reportedly imploded during a fire drill exercise at school in Thailand, killing one Thai student and injuring five others, according to local media. 
A male student died from the implosion while five others suffered minor injuries, two of which have been sent to a hospital for medical care. British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak said he was not focused on the past but rather on the future. Days after lawmakers sanctioned Boris Johnson for deliberating the Sweden Parliament overruled breaking parties held during the COVID-19 pandemic. A report compiled by the US Office of the Director of National Intelligence says North Korea's leader Kim Jong-un will most likely employ coercive measures, including nuclear threats, to achieve political objectives and deter a strong Seoul Washington response. That is all from us here at World News Tonight. Join us again tomorrow as we keep you up to date with the latest from around the world. In case you missed any of the stories tonight, you can watch the whole program on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. We leave you tonight with visuals of the Royal Ascot's gold cut, better known as Ladies' Day, where rainbow outfits took the center stage. Good night and have a pleasant Friday night.